Hi, everybody. Welcome to another round of Iris Hep uh, Fellowship presentations. Um, up first, we have Scott. Um, one of Scott's mentors was uh, was uh, Nick Smith. Um, Nick, do you want to say a few words before uh, Scott presents? Um, sure, I'll just mention that um, when we started this over the summer with uh, the goals that are outlined in Scott's talk, and I think he really uh, took to the project quickly and uh, did a really nice job with um, you know, developing a lot of Python expertise, um, you know, library building, which is very different from, you know, Python to to get a to get a result, which is what he had experience with before. So now, hopefully, he goes into the world with some much better. Uh, um, software development practices, which is great, of course, for science. That's what we all want is software for sustainable science. So I guess all I'll say. All right, thanks. Uh, whenever you're ready, Scott. Okay. Uh, all right, so starting now. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Scott. And uh, as mentioned before, my mentors are Nick Smith and, and Jim Pavarsky. Uh, this summer, I worked on enabling Dask interoperability with extra de-accessible storage systems. Now, that's a long name, but I'll explain what that means in, in a moment. Firstly, though, we need to talk about the three main elements of this project. Uh, Dask is a Python library used for scaling up Python code. Uh, it can take code meant to run on a laptop and make it run on a cluster with very few changes on the user's part. It also extends common data types to be larger than can fit on RAM, like super large multi gigabyte NumPy arrays, for example. Uh, Dask gets all that data that it processes through a file system interface called FSSpec, uh, which stands for File System Specification. Uh, FSSpec provides one set of commands for many different storage backends. It lets a Dask and the other packages that use it get data from different kinds of remote servers without having to worry about the specifics of each kind. Uh, and one of those types of remote servers, you call it, is XRD, which is very commonly used in high energy physics. Uh, a fine example of this is the, the CERN open data service, which is XRD accessible. Uh, that makes downloading data sets very easy. Uh, you can also run XRD servers on your local machine to make file handling more convenient. So, uh, uh, hold up a second, I'm having a, uh, okay, all right, cool, never mind. All right, so uh, here's an example of something you might do with Dask. Uh, on the middle line, Dask is reading the data from a CSV file located at the URL given. And Dask accepts whatever uh, systems FSPEC supports since Dask uses FSPEC to, to read data. So for example, this URL might lead to a Google Drive or, or something. Uh, and the login information for that remote data source is usually part of the URL. Uh, oh, but the... Uh, the problem is that FSPEC doesn't support extra D. Uh, if you're a Dask user and you want to get your data from an extra D server, you need to use external packages and write some extra code. Uh, you can't just put the extra D URL in the URL space. Uh, well, there are workarounds, like the ones I just mentioned. It isn't the most convenient considering all the other storage types take so little effort in comparison. So the solution to this problem was to create a package that saves the user the hassle. But once installed, Dask will accept extra URLs just as easy as it does any other. Our package is called FSPEC extra D and is ready to install from PyPI, which is the Python package index. So you just type pip install FSPEC extra D into your console and you got it. Uh, so this is the same code from before, but with an extra D URL. Uh, once you've pip installed our package, this code will run just fine. 
there are a lot of uh, XRD specific stuff going on in the background, but the user doesn't have to worry about it. As a side note, by right down here, uh, XRD URLs start with the prefix root. I mean, it's not related to like the root directory of the system or anything. It's just it's just root. Uh, okay. So, all right. So the, the intent of this project was to make a DAS work with XRD, which we did. But our package doesn't actually have anything to do with DAS in particular. Our package lets FSpec talk to XRD servers and DAS just uses FSpec. So this relationship is represented on the right where DAS depends on FSpec, which depends on our package, which talks to the server. Uh, what this means is that even if you are just using FSpec and not using DAS, you can still use our package to talk with XRD servers. So far, we have only been talking about FSpec in relation to Dask, but FSpec is a useful tool on its own right. Uh, and here we have some examples of how FSpec is used with our package. Uh, here we use the, the with statement, which is automatically closed the file when we are done. So in the first chunk of text, we're, we're reading a file at the URL given. Um, and you can do all, this, all the basic file operations like reading, writing, and seeking. It's very similar to the built-in Python file commands, but uh, you can also access remote files when you do it with FSpec. Uh, and there are also system level commands like on the, the next bunch uh, that let you do things like listing the entries at a directory at, in the, from the server you're reading from, or getting info about those directories or searching files by name. Uh, you can even run commands concurrently using Python's async keywords, uh, like in the bottom line there. Uh, there's a lot more stuff that FSpec lets you do, and you can read about it on the FSpec docs. But the point here is that our package now lets you do all those things that FSpec does with XRD systems. And all you need to do is give FSpec the URL. So again, before this package, if you gave FSpec an XRD system URL, it wouldn't work, but now it does. So. So this is all part of a larger effort to unify a few pre-existing tools with Desk. Uh, on the right, you can see each pre-existing software package linked by arrows, which represent the software that connects them. Like my project is represented by the B arrow, which connects FSpec to XRD. Arrow C, D, and E are currently being developed, and arrows A and F already exist. So as it stands right now, uh, you know, Dask can read uh, directly. Uh, it can directly read extra D files uh, through FSpec. Uh, when all the connections are finished, Dask users will be able to use extra D servers. Uh, they will also be able to interpret dot root files, which is what dot root does, uh, and organize data using awkward array, which is what awkward array does. Uh, all these features will be built into Dask to make the user experience more seamless. And the end result will be that Dask users can spend less time programming and more time doing physics or whatever using Dask for. Um, I want to take a slide to talk about my experience with this project and the fellowship. Uh, this is very much a learning experience for me, especially in terms of programming. Before this fellowship, I had written basic scripts for doing what are pretty much math calculations and plots, uh, but I've never had to create a software product before. And what I mean by software product is a piece of software that'll be used by people I don't know and who might use it in ways I wouldn't think of. I think of a lot of edge cases and handling and how to handle errors in a way that would make sense to the potential user um, who would not know anything about the software under the hood. My code also had to meet rigorous standards. I wrote scripts for testing every aspect of the code and had to pass every test before every branch merge on GitHub. I also used editing tools like pre-commit to make sure my formatting was up to the standard. I had to worry about things like dependencies and use virtual environments to make sure everything was working smoothly with the right versions of everything. Uh, and at the end of all this, I got to publish something on PyPI for the first time. And so along with all this, 
as, uh, as Nick uh, mentioned earlier, I uh, sharpened my Python abilities when I got to practice some more object oriented stuff and learn to implement asynchronous code, uh, which is, I guess, one of the more tricky parts of our package. I also learned to use GitHub, which I had used very little in the past, but now I'm using it for all my projects. And uh, reading documentation is usually a trivial thing, but it was different in this case because I've never had to read documentation as intimately, I guess, before this project. Like I'm not just, I didn't have to, I wasn't just reading uh, to learn how to use a set of code, but I was also reading to learn exactly how it works so that my package can interface with it. Uh, reading other people's code, especially when you're not familiar with it, like I was, was the slowest part for me. And I don't know if this applies to everyone, but during this project, I discovered that everything takes longer than you initially think it will. Uh, and I guess that's probably a rule of thumb uh, to carry around with me. Uh, it was on, on top of all this stuff, I had a good time. So, you know, that, that's also uh, a good part of my experience. Um, to summarize, we made a package that lets a dash and FSpec access extra D data. The full ecosystem I talked about earlier is coming soon. And I'll take questions if there are any. But uh, that's it for the presentation. And then I will say I did have a software demo, but um, I'm currently having issues with it. So we're going to skip it for now. Uh, so that's it. Uh, thank you. All right. Nice job, Scott. Any questions for Scott? Um, can I ask a quick question? Absolutely. <laughs> Scott, uh, fantastic talk and also some very cool uh, work, um, as I guess you discovered and was the plan and uh, along. I love how these small little building blocks can fit together to build such a large and uh, useful uh, ecosystem. Um, I just want to see a clarification, see if I understood uh, correctly. The This allows you to open any file, basically, uh, over the Xroot D uh, or the Xroot protocol. And then there's another pre existing FS spec which knows how to take some file that's been opened and interpret it as a uh, uproot file and load it into Dask. So when I open one of these root files uh, over Xroot D just using the Dask uh, load, the, you know, the read. Uh, whatever it was, uh, method, it invokes several of these files all at once. I mean, several of these modules, several of these libraries, uh, just chain them together automatically. Is that correct? Well, that is the, that is the end goal. And, and that works for certain file uh, formats, like CSV, for example. Dask has the ability to uh, interpret a, a CSV file, but it uh, doesn't currently interpret the uh, files that have a dot root at the end. Uh, and that's what upgroup does. So all FSPEC does is read the bytes from a file. And there's other code that actually has to like interpret those bytes. Okay. Does that make they sense? Could, yes, it does. And so those could be modules like the either the FF, uh, FSPEC uh, upgrade or Dask awkward, which would do that job. Yes. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Thank you yeah, so, so much. Just, uh, thank you for the question. And just to clarify, yes, yeah, so the, the module that I wrote for my project, the like goal it does is read bytes, right? But it's able to read them from extra D sources and passes them up the chain. And the interpretation of those bytes happens later on, so. Okay, great. Okay, any other questions for Scott? Oh, uh, Enrico, you have your hand raised? Yeah, thank you, Scott. It was this is really interesting. Um, Enrico from the root team here. So of course the, the natural question is uh so what's missing to actually read uh root files directly into Dask? Maybe it's more of a question for uh, oh, yeah, that, that's um for the, the person responsible for the other parts of the ecosystem, but well you see okay. that is I mean I'm not working on that part, so I don't have any details, but that's represented by arrow C on the diagram. And uh yeah, so that's, you know, you, you want to ask Kush about that. 
Yeah, I mean, they can add. There's quite a bit of development still in the works to basically, um, you know, get Awkward version two and Desk fully uh, integrated to the point where <clears throat> Desk understands, you know, how to um, lazily evaluate um, an Awkward array that is being sourced from a root file. Um, um, so let's say there's a lot of connections that have to be made and they're all sort of in an active development. I'll say at the moment, at least uh, if you take my PR, you can, you know, use Uproot. <laughs> you can do the same thing with Uproot that you could do before, but now using FSpec instead of using um, the Uproot's built-in XRoot D uh, source. So in some sense, we haven't really made any, let's say, visible user facing changes but we've been building out the stack in a way that uh, you get more things for free when you when it's complete like for example uproot being able to read any any uh remote file system that fspec supports um, not just root right yeah no got it uh of course it's uh uh right the full picture will be realized once all the all the pieces are there and then everything lights up together and it's uh, it's beautiful all right yeah. thank you Although very much i will say um people right now can now you know write terabytes of parquet using desk to extra d servers which a lot of people have and that's a very useful feature so with this tool you can uh, read and write large data sets into desk from your favorite uh, uh, extra d enabled storage system that you have permission to read and write to All right, thank you. Uh, uh, again, thanks, Scott. Um, next up is uh, Maya. Maya, you want to go ahead and share your screen? Hi, I'm Maya, uh, Maya Wallach, and uh, I'm a junior at Michigan State University. And uh, I worked with the Alpha Group at Davidson College in collaboration with FRIB and Iris Hep. And uh, my project is unsupervised learning to build pre-train models at the ATTPC. Uh, the ATTPC is a particle detector at the facility for rare isotope beams. Uh, it works by aiming a beam of, part of isotopes into a gas, which acts as the detecting medium and the target. Uh, we hope to make an unsupervised pre-training model that can be used for all ATTPC experiments. Uh, we're doing this because labeling training sets is incredibly tedious and takes a very long time with large data sets and retraining models for every experiment is incredibly time consuming uh, since experimental parameters change every few weeks. Uh, I personally saw this firsthand uh, in my internship there because a lot of my peers were working on supervised models and uh, they would sit down for, for hours just tediously labeling data. Uh, they had they called them like labeling parties and um, as fun as those sounded, um, yeah. Um, that time could have probably been used for, for other and better things. Um, so uh, for our project, we uh, used ATTPC data from uh, two main experiments. Uh, one, uh, one was with uh, an oxygen-16 beam and uh, helium as the gas medium, and the other one had magnesium-22 as the beam. And, uh, helium also was the gas medium for that one. And uh, the, da the data was uh, unlabeled and each event is represented as a point cloud. A point cloud is just a collection of points in, in a space. Uh, and some examples are shown on the, on the right here. Uh, yeah, so to make this model, we use PointNet, which is an architecture that's designed to take uh, to intake point clouds. Uh, so this means that, uh, that the point, that the order of the points is completely invariant. So, uh, and it also makes pointwise predictions. But the issue with point net is that it's uh, supervised, meaning that uh, uh, that our stuff would have to have labels. Uh, but we're trying to accomplish an unsupervised task, so we had to get creative with how uh, we approached this problem. Uh, so to do this, we had to first voxelize the data, and each voxel is then indexed, and then we saved a group of events as a control group by keeping them unshuffled in the next step. Uh, after that, the voxels of the rest of the events get shuffled to different areas of the point cloud. And then the point net model would attempt to put the voxels at the correct index um, 
you can think of this process like uh, shuffling around uh, a Rubik's cube and then already solving it. Uh, I think that the um, that the figure on the um, on the right is a good job uh, representing that. So uh, the input is uh, the scrambled data, and the output would be the unscrambled data here. Um, yeah, but the issue with experimental data is that it's filled with events without reactions, which just look like points randomly scattered on a plane. Uh, this is a problem because it's, it's going to be very hard for a model to predict where the voxel was originally. Um, but we found that these events tended to have less points than the ones with tracks. Uh, so the one on the, on the left here, that one is an example of an event without a track, and the one on the right it's an example with one with, with tracks here. Um, but uh, we ended up solving this problem by filtering out all events that had less than about 500 points. This got rid of a lot of beam events, but it cut our data by about a sixth. Uh, see this plot on the bottom here is, um, uh, th this one shows uh, the length of the, of the events by the, the number of them. Uh, and you can see that there are a lot of events with, uh, uh, with only, with like less than 250 points. Uh, so we, we planned on training on a large amount of uh, unlabeled experimental data from various other experiments. Uh, we worked with oxygen 16 uh, and helium gas data, but at the end of the day, we're not really interested in solving Rubik's cubes. Um, we have to do event and track classification using the output found in global endpoint features in the, uh, as you can see in the model's architecture below. Uh, we expect this to work uh, because in the past, similar methods have been used to classify objects like chairs and planes and things like that. Um, so after PointNet predicts uh, where the voxels were originally, we find that the reconstruction accuracy, uh, that this is just the percent of voxels in an event that are pr predicted correctly. Uh, we find that the model on average reshuffles at about 70%. Uh, and we get a distribution as shown in this slide. The reshuffling, the re, sorry, the reconstruction accuracy is represented on the x-axis and the number of events is on the y-axis. As you can see, most of the points are on the two tails of the graph. Um, yeah, so uh, looking at these plots, you should look at them as, um, as pairs and uh, the the left pair is the left side. It's uh, the one with the original event. And the one on the right is uh, the event, is how the model predicted the event would be. Um, and so uh, in that plot, you'll notice that there are red and uh, blue points. And uh, the blue points are the ones that were predicted correctly, and the red ones were the uh, ones predicted uh, incorrectly. Uh, so if we look at the events uh, that end up in the tails of the distribution, uh, interestingly, you'll notice that the model seems to suffer when dealing with events with uh, like extremely defined tracks with very little noise. Like in event uh, 8062, you'll notice that um, uh, the, that's a very incredibly defined track here, but it seems to predict it uh, incredibly wrong. Um, and another thing that I noticed was um, the model seems to predict that all events are a lot more condensed than they are, uh, which is very interesting. But um, the model obviously didn't do so well with, uh, uh, with events with uh, no tracks uh, or anything at all. But um, it seems to succeed when there's uh, like a very, uh, there's smaller tracks and a little bit of noise. Um, so, uh, going forward, the model should be trained uh, on data from more experience on more experiments, since we only really used oxygen 16 and magnesium 22 data. Uh, and uh, in the future, we're hoping to fine tune the model with a small amount of uh, hand labeled data and uh, see if this matches uh, uh, see if this matches like supervised uh, models uh, with larger hand labeled uh, data sets. Um, I'm now happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, Maya. Any any questions for Maya? Um, this is Gordon. Uh, really nice, uh, really nice work. Um, thank you. I I just wanted to ask on. I think it was your last slide 
uh, when you talk about matching, uh, you know, see how its performance compares to a larger uh, uh, label. So and, and basically, I think what you're talking about there is right is uh, supervised uh, training. Yeah. Um, what would you expect? What What do you expect to happen uh, in that comparison? Um. Well, uh, we would hope that it. Uh, well, we would hope that it uh, does as well, right? Uh, uh, at okay. least as well as the supervised model, right? Right. Uh, but uh, our goal here is uh, just uh, is to make a model that uh, that works with the least amount of effort. Uh, oh, of course, of course, assist. and and it's always necessary to compare it with with other uh, other methods. Uh, clearly, um, but I guess you know what I would expect is that the supervised training would do better, and the unsupervised right. training would discover some you know corner cases that just weren't in the labeled data set. Yeah. But so, yeah. All right. I was wondering if there might be something deeper to be learned there. Okay, perfect. Thank you. No problem. All right. Uh, any other questions for Maya? Uh, while he's fixing up his sharing screen. Uh, so I'm Bridge, just to introduce our team. I'm from CMS Monitoring and Analytics Group. And I'm one of the co-managers for this project. Uh, uh, my colleagues Tehun and uh, Federica are also connected here. And uh, just to introduce Carlo, uh, uh, he started his IRSA fellowship after, right after his first year of engineering, uh, uh, bachelor's, bachelor's of engineering. Uh, he's from uh, Taras Sebchenko uh, National yeah, University Chenko of, University University uh, uh, of uh, uh, Kiev, Ukraine. Yeah. And I let him start. So yeah, um, my name is Kirilla. This is my final project report uh, of the Iris Hub project. It is called Implementation of CI-CD Automation and Orchestration in CMS Monitoring Kubernetes Clusters. Uh, as you can tell, I've worked with um, CERN team. My mentors are Breach, Jihun, and Federica. They are all here today. The period of the project is July, September, 2022. Um, as for me, I'm 18 years old, first year bachelor student, and yeah, let's let's move on. <laughs> so um, I will give a short overview of the work that um, CMS monitoring team conducts, the team that I've worked in. Then I will, of course, cover how I contributed to this work and explain how I met the objectives of my project. So first, let's let's quickly go through the objectives. Uh, the main idea was to migrate CMS Spark jobs to Kubernetes, and um, it it is uh, basically our goal because it will increase sustainability and ease the management of scripts in CMS Spark. The scripts mainly dump data from monitoring services database, and we are actually talking about petabytes of data. Um, so there is a lot of computing power needed to execute each script, and some may take more than 12 hours to execute. And that's why uh, my steps were implementing testing utilities for this Spark job outputs, and they were written to Hadoop distributed file system, Elasticsearch, and local storage. Also, um, applying testing utilities individually to each CMS Spark job, basically the testing utilities that I mentioned earlier, then migrating these ready CMS Spark cron jobs to Kubernetes. And the final step was to explore and implement continuous deployment and integration options. I will then give an overview of my work and also the summary, of course. But now let's take a look at um, the global picture of my project. So as you may know, um, CMS experiment generates huge amounts of data. 
there is the Large Hadron Collider, which um, sends its results to worldwide Large Hadron Collider computing grid, as well as the CMS computing services. And then um, CMS monitoring team, which I took part in, uses the data produced by CERN IT and MONIT services to build its infrastructure and it's basically to develop solutions to make analysis of this data possible using open source tools and uh, actually on the right hand side you can see one of the monitoring dashboards and uh, there are lots of services you can monitor more than 100 production dashboards and all engineers all over CERN are using them here are a few more examples of the dashboards that you can see. Okay, now let's take a look at the CMS monitoring infrastructure, the infrastructure that our team basically uses. Um, Monit is an infrastructure provided by CRNIT that offers monitoring applications and it is used by CMS to monitor computing services. And you can think of this block as of backend to the graph and dashboard on the previous slide. So first data gets injected from HD Condor, VM Agent and CRAP into tools such as Spark and Kafka to get processed. And then uh, it gets stored in Elasticsearch, InfluxDB and Hadoop distributed file system. And this is basically the two blocks that my project took its part in. And then the process data gets sent to, basically you can monitor it with Grafana, Kibana and Swan. Okay, um, let's move on. And if we look at it in even more detail, on the top, you can see the production services, data from them going to CERN Monit and then basically to the graph. But underneath it, there are actually five Kubernetes clusters that CMS monitoring uses to properly manage all these tools. And my project is actually the uh, sixth Kubernetes cluster which would contain uh, PySpark scripts that we are running. And uh, instead of just using, like instead of running them using CronTab in the usual environment, we wanted to run it in Kubernetes as a cron job kind. And you can see it on bottom left. Also, you can see the Flux CD and Helm. These are um, some other tools that we will talk later about. Okay, and yeah, this is the workflow of a cron job. So from storage, data gets processed with Spark. Then there is some messaging with ActiveMQ and then it goes to Elasticsearch. Um, about the technologies that I've used, it is of course Git and GitHub to coordinate our work, collaborate and do some version control. Then I had to get familiar with Bash to write the testing scripts that I talked about earlier to make sure that our um, CMS Spark jobs run correctly. PySpark, uh, I had to also learn about it quite a little bit because I had to analyze the scripts to understand what's going on. HDFS and Elasticsearch for data storage. Prometheus and Push Gateway are tools used for event monitoring and alerting. Kubernetes, which is the final part of my project for container orchestration and automatic deployment. Helm charts. Um, Helm basically is a tool that allows you to make a single package for all your Kubernetes manifests and manage it how you like. Flux CD for continuous deployment of the mentioned Helm charts. And also there was LX Plus, the technology that uh, allowed me to SSH into remote server and work with the scripts. 
So uh, mainly I was working um, with two GitHub repositories, CMS Spark and CMS Kubernetes in DMVM. And let's look at my pull requests to understand how the timeline of my project was going. So at first, um, of course, as I said, we had to implement some testing for HDFS, Elasticsearch, and the usual file system, because uh, CMS Spark scripts run data, um, execute, and uh, produce a lot of logs. And in the future, if we just move them to Kubernetes like that, we won't be really able to monitor if they executed correctly. So that's why we had to check the output after um, running each, each of them, basically. So this was the first pull request. Then there was the second, based on the first, of course, which was then implementing this basically using these testing utilities in each of the CMS per crunch ups. Um, at that time, almost each crunch up had different structure. That's why it took a lot of time for me to apply the utilities properly without causing any troubles. And while working with one of the scripts called cron 4 dbs Condor, uh, I also managed to find the bug. So we'll talk about it a bit. The bug was uh, the fact that this uh, Spark job was writing data to HDFS, but skipping one day of the month. So as you know, in July, there are 31 days, but um, only till the day 30, it was generated. And I found out this by just testing it and testing and then getting confused by the fact that there is like one file missing. And due to some hard coded parts, yeah, it was missing the last day of the month. And this was later fixed by one of my other pull requests, which is the next one. So um, the problem was fixed by listing both months of data and removing dependency on the .tmp file which is kind of file that is generated uh, before today has passed, basically. Okay, um, next we had to monitor the cron job status with Prometheus. Prometheus is a tool that pulls out logs and metrics in real time to monitor them and alert if something happens. However, However, the cron jobs usually, of course, run just once. So if one executes every morning at, let's say, 6 a.m., it runs for 40 minutes and completes. Prometheus won't be able to monitor it because it will continue pulling out data from it when it's already executed. But Push Gateway was a tool that we used to expose the metrics expose the final status uh, continuously and make Prometheus able to monitor it. Then um, there was one of the most important ones. So um, Kubernetes is a tool that allows us to create an environment to specifically for the scripts to run. And each script runs in its own ecosystem, basically, which gives the possibility for scaling, automation, storage orchestration, and some other features. I created um, three pull requests in this block. One was to create a basic template with Kubernetes cron job kind and later build up on it another to manage the networking capabilities of every script with services.yaml file and another one for deployment of remaining scripts okay um, then the next step was to create a helm, helm chart because we have around 10 cron jobs in kubernetes and they all share some common values and helm is a tool that allowed me 
using templates, using Go language templates to pull out these common values and basically made, make one um, package which you can modify easily and it will deploy all the cron jobs uh, with just one single command, simple command. And it can be parameterized to run in tests and production clusters, for example, and manage service ports that we used in our scripts. And the final part of my project is Flux CD continuous integration. So according to my project's timeline, the last stage is about exploration of CI CD pipelines, but we were actually pretty close to implementing it because Helm charts can be adapted to be used with Flux CD Helm operator, a tool provided by Flux CD. And by configuring it itself, um, the goal can be reached pretty soon. So uh, there is already a sketch on its structure, how we are going to use it and how the pipeline will function. So in future, this um, will be the base of other CMS Spark services. Okay. Um, and yeah, the summary. So I can certainly say that this project is something that has impacted my life view. I've gonna gained a lot of production experience, uh, had some hands-on experience with technologies that they have never touched before, but only heard about. I also realized that uh, even such a small team, like CMS monitoring team, can provide, can be basically really essential uh, for other engineers as they make it possible for data to be analyzed properly. Um, I want to thank my mentors for providing all the support and leading me through the big CERN ecosystem and the Iris Hub community for providing me with such an opportunity. So, yeah, thank you very much for your attention. Oh, nice talk. Uh, any questions? Comments? Well, it's good to hear that you had such a uh, you know, positive experience. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, thank you for your work, and we're glad that you were very happy that you, yes. you, uh, you got <laughs> something you. out of it, too. So yeah. Thanks so, a lot. That's, yeah. That's our goal. So, thanks. Okay, then I'll start. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Aryan. Uh, I'm an uh, Iris Hub Fellow from Manipal Institute of Technology, and my mentor is Dr. Jim Pevarsky. Uh, in this fellowship, I worked on accelerating uproot with Awkward Fourth, and that's what I'll be talking about in today's presentation. Okay, so first of all, what is uproot? Well, uproot is a Python library for root IO in pure Python. Uh, it mainly uses NumPy to do the deserialization work. Uh, and it's also only for reading and writing root files, nothing else. Uh, it doesn't do uh, uh, the other things that the C++ root does. Uh, it differs from the other uh, Pythonic uh, implementations of root IO, such as PyRoot and root NumPy, in that it is independent of the C++ root. <clears throat> so, okay, having introduced uproot, uh, one question that might pop, if, pop up in your head is, uh, isn't Python slow? Why would you want to do uh, file IO in Python? Well, that's true, but uh, root tree trees have uh, two types of uh, serialization in them. One is a columnar type, which is uh, numeric data and ragged arrays, and the uh, everything else is record-oriented. Uh, you can see in the image on the bottom right, uh, I've tried to crudely explain the difference between both and uh, <clears throat> this difference is important because when it comes to python uh, the implementation would be slow except for columnar data and this is because uh, when uh, python encounters columnar data it can cast a whole block of data as a numpy array which would achieve the objective of deserializing the data in 
uh, order of one time. But for record-oriented data, we cannot do better than order of n, where n is the number of uh, data points. So, uh, you know, we want to avoid using Python for deserializing record-oriented data. Of course, O of n in a compiled language is much better than O of n in Python. Okay, so uh, we have the problem on our hands, which is Python is slow, but if you want to speed it up, you need some sort of compilation tool chain, but they are heavy dependencies. So what do you do? Well, uh, you use a specialized interpreted language. Uh, this paper released in 2021 uh, introduced awkward fourth, which is a domain specific language for file IO uh, in awkward arrays. Uh, the VM for awkward fourth ships with awkward arrays, and uh, uh, it's very easy to install, which sort of uh, eliminates the problem of heavy dependence. Uh, awkward fourth is of course based on fourth, which is an old programming language, and we'll see ahead, uh, it's also weird. Now next, uh, on to the next problem, which is speed. Uh, we can use fourth, but you know it has to be faster than Python for us to have any advantage. And uh, well, in an informal study, uh, it was found that Python on average took 900 nanoseconds per instruction to execute, whereas awkward fourth only took five nanoseconds on the same machine, which is a big speed up. So uh, uh, like Python and Java, awkward fourth instructions are turned into bytecode to be later interpreted by a virtual machine, which I mentioned is shipped with awkward fourth, awkward array, sorry. Uh, but there are some uh, uh, key differences between Python and awkward fourth that uh, gives it the speed that we need. First is uh, Python checks types at runtime, uh, whereas awkward fourth can only have one time, which is uh, integers. So uh, there's no type checking. Also, Python follows object pointers at runtime, uh, whereas awkward fourth uh, has only one data structure. So it doesn't need to follow object pointers at runtime. Uh, this is all to illustrate that awkward fourth is a very minimal language and it's suited to our needs. So uh, I started this project by writing an Avro file last year, Avro file reader last year uh, with awkward fourth. Uh, the results that we obtained were very encouraging. It was eight times faster than fast Avro, which is the gold standard for reading Avro files. Uh, and we achieved the uh, predicted uh, theoretical performance that we thought we would be achieving. So that served as a proof of concept for moving on to root. Okay, so how do we implement this for root? Uh, well, for reading root files uh, in uproot, uh, you have to generate awkward fourth code by uh, appending small bits of strings uh, through uh, uh, while the whole while walking through the whole file, and uh, this is done by interviewing the awkward fourth code generation with the Python implementation that already exists. We didn't get rid of the current Python implementation because uh, a lot of the type parsing for root tree trees already exists and we didn't want to reinvent the wheel. Uh, so uh, just for the ease of maintenance, we have, what we have done is we have uh, put fourth generation and Python code uh, in, uh, uh, alternatively. So uh, whenever someone has to modify one, they can see what changes have to ma be made to the other. Uh, this of course is called meta programming, which is, uh, writing Python code that generates awkward fourth code. You can see what this looks like in the image below. Uh, it's a bit weird to get used to, but uh, that's uh, that's where it gets even weirder. Uh, there are root uh, file types which specify the data type in a file using tstreamer info. So uh, even the Python class that reads that data type has to be generated on the fly. So uh, what I had to do to interweave uh, fourth code generation with this was do meta meta programming, which is Python that generates Python that generates awkward fourth. Uh, you can see a very, very simple example of meta meta programming uh, in this image below. Uh, of course, if you want to look at, look at it more deeply, you can go to the GitHub repository uh, of Uproot and uh, this was uh, the most complicated part of the project, which uh, took a while to master, but 
uh, in the end, I was able to cover all the uh, known data types uh, in DStreamer uh, info. Okay, what about the performance? Well, uh, the awkward fourth paper that I described before predicted uh, what the performance would be like for a uh, awkward fourth based root file reader. On the left, you can see the predicted performance. Uh, you can see the Python based, purely Python based reader uh, uh, drops off in performance when it comes to doubly nested and triply nested uh, arrays because that's where things get uh, record oriented. And before that, it's uh, all columnar. So uh, Python can just cast whole data blocks, as I said before. And on the right, you can see the uh, performance that we got after the implementation was done. And you can see it matches the predicted performance one to one. Uh, and uh, the absolute number that we got was uh, it's 400 times faster when it comes to some of the key data types uh, compared to the old Python implementation. Okay, so in conclusion, uh, we achieved the predicted performance, which is uh, 400 times faster for an awkward fourth base root D tree reader. Uh, the new, new reader is extremely fast without having to install a compiler. Uh, the awkward fourth code generation involves, of course, metaprogramming and meta metaprogramming. And it's all merged into main. So uh, you can start using it. Uh, okay, that was it from my side. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Arian. Nice talk. Uh, any questions for Arian? Uh, could you put your, uh, yeah, well, while you're answering Alex's uh, question, maybe you could put that uh, last slide back up, or maybe I'll actually, I'll just go get it from the agenda. Oh, no, that's fine. I put it up. Do you have something okay. specific, Gordon, or you want me to switch to yeah, Alex? Yeah, no, let, let Alex go first, because I've already asked a bunch. Okay. Uh, Alex, go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, I, I'm wondering about the performance comparisons here, because um, it's, it's interesting to see that there's such a large difference now to C++ root as well. Uh, is this something that root would also benefit from? And like, does it make sense to upstream that into root? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, uh, I'm not sure what you're talking about because the C++ root, uh, it's only, uh, it only outperforms C++ root when it comes to pure float, right? And for the other data types, uh, it's same or, a little bit less. And the reason why it outperforms float, uh, pure float uh, file is because uh, in awkward fourth, you can reduce uh, reading of just one pure data, uh, one primitive data type to one command. And since the time for execution scales linearly, linearly with the number of commands in awkward fourth, uh, that's a very special case where it can outperform even C++. But otherwise, there's no reason uh, why C++ could benefit from this. So uh, C++ root could benefit from this. OK, thanks. Yeah. I, I guess I, I had a question along the same lines, although slightly different. So um, the RN tuple line on that performance plot there, right. um, uh, when you, um, that's RN tuple reading an RN tuple, right? Uh, I'm I'm not sure because uh, that plot is from a paper that talked about different ah. uh, ways, uh, different ways that you can use awkward form. Uh, okay. Uh, I I'm only I was only uh, involved with the uh, part where they're reading root D trees. Uh, okay. Okay. But so, the answer right. to that specific question cannot but be yes. Uh, RN tuple only reads RN tuples. Right. Right. So I'm trying to understand how to compare that. Um, yeah, is so it, the, is so it just, RN. I guess it's just the, so megabytes per second, is that megabytes of uncompressed data per second? Yes, I mean, that's uh, uncompressed data. Yep. Okay. So you've written it in two different formats on that plot then one in R and tuple and the other in regular, uh, well, I guess not regular, but right. The, in the T tree format. Okay. Yep. Perfect. Yep. All right, that's really fascinating. Uh, some really excellent work. Thanks. Thank you. All right, nice job, Arian. Uh, any other questions? All right, 
Okay. So the objective for my fellowship project were to work on Boost histogram, especially the new free features added to the Python Boost histogram library, and then rectify a couple of bugs on the library. Um, and then, although my initially my fellowship project was based on the Python and the Boost histogram, I also started working on the C++ and Boost dot histogram, and then. Um, I added a new accumulator with help of Hans on the same. And then I also worked on adding some documentation on both of them. Introducing Boost histogram. Well, histograms in general are just frequency distribution based, um, like visualization of, um, like not necessarily visualization, but they are um, just frequency based distribution for objects and Boost histogram in general is the one of the most extensive and powerful histogram libraries in C++. And it also provides a lot of lots of features um, and it's easy to use. It's also fast, quite fast to be honest. Um, and it's extensible and has multi-dimensional histograms and profiles. Now, in terms of Boost histogram, which is the Python binding of Boost histogram, the C++ and um, my original work was based on that and it also has a lot of tools like plotting tools and we can perform a lot of operations and there's a lot of access manipulation. You can fetch details from them. You can convert them to NumPy um, and a lot of interesting stuff. Uh, I will link both of uh, C++ and Python um, docs in here. The first issue, or actually the second issue I worked on, the first one was a comparison bit, which is something that I'll discuss later. Um, the second issue I worked on was on providing better errors for um, like incorrect samples for the mean storage. Um, now in histograms, we have uh, storages, mean and weighted mean are one of them. Now for mean storage, uh, we needed to provide better errors when someone didn't pass a sample. So the PR that was merged added three specific tests for incorrect sample. The first one was just empty sample. If you don't provide anything, then it will let you know that you uh, can provide a sample. Then if the sample that is not correct, then for example, we don't accept anything other than errors which are one dimensional. Then in that case, we, uh, let the user know that there is based on the fact that the type is not correct. And in case the type is right, we have an array. In that case, we also need to make sure that it's 1D array, uh, which we cannot have um, 2D or just any other dimension of array other than 1D array. So all these three tests were added. And now if you don't provide a correct sample for the mean storage in Boost histogram, the Python end, it will give you an error. Now, this is the first issue I worked on, something that took quite a lot of time. We wanted to add comparison for histogram. Now, this is something that needs to check a lot of aspects with histogram objects. Um, and what we ended up doing was uh, we added a histogram compare operator or uh, well, to focus on the actual, but it, it was a function for each and every histogram. You can just do a histogram and then Add a function or the operator all closed, and then put the second histogram, it will give you the comparison between both of them. And we also added ufunc for numpy's all closed because numpy already had all closed function. So then we wanted to add functionality where you can perform the exact same thing uh, on histogram, both histogram, but then rather than going to numpy, it just checks our custom function. Now the custom function was uh, like the custom function checks. A lot of aspects of histogram. The first one is, of course, the values inside the histogram, uh, which is basically converting the histogram object to NumPy and then checking all the values. And we also check the edges of the histogram. In histogram, we have we need to provide uh, both uh, the standing mean and edges and the number of planes inside it. So we check the edges of it, also the dimension, especially the storage type. Um, even if we have the exact same values. Um, edges dimension, but if the story type is integer for one and float for the other, or like not really float, um, but if it's in, in integer and if it's not integer, then it should throw an error, even though the values are same. And also we check the axis. Now, 
this is the public uh, PR, which is the part which we wanna explore, expose to the users. On the private end, this is something we're gonna have inside the tests that we perform for comparison. So uh, what we have in public version is that if you compare the two histograms, then it will give you some pretty return in terms of the, uh, the error in the comparison. It could be the value suggest or any of those. Um, attributes of histogram but in the private one we simply give google in returns whether it's true or false um, so that can be useful when we want to have tests running in, uh, inside github and then there were a couple of minor updates to bootstagram the first one was adding a storage type function and property now this is something i uh, like this is an issue i found while working on the comparison um, PR where I could not, I could, I would, I would simply not find the storage type, how to fetch the storage type for a histogram until Henry helped me figure out what I had to do, which was underscore storage type, underscore type. Um, and this is something that we did not expose yet to uh, the users, and that's why I wasn't able to find it. But this is something that we found that we should allow people to fetch. So now it is a function and property inside both histogram with the deprecation warning for the previous one. We also swapped uh, NumPy testing assets with PyTest approach. Um, now this is still under under the rough, uh, swapping all of the NumPy testing assets to PyTest approach. Um, and th th that's something that we need to figure out, although the PI is up and it's just a decision that we need to make. And the final thing was a minor documentation issue with uh, cause some con confusion for a couple of people in terms of what the reset does. Um, so that has been um, solved. And after all the updates, we had a patch release 1.3.2, which was released um, around a week ago, and it's, it's up there now. On the C++ end, I, I worked on adding a new fraction accumulator. Um, so, as I mentioned earlier, in a book, in a histogram, we have um, accumulators in double unlimited. Now we've added a new one called fraction uh, inside the C++ end. Now this accumulator has the following aspects. Now the fraction accumulator basically is a uh, storage uh, or like it basically it accumulates boolean values. Now once you have boolean values, uh, the true ones are successes, the false ones are failures. Now, once you have accumulator set up and you uh, fill the accumulator with the values, you can perform a bunch of operations on it or well, you can fetch um, some aspects, aspects from it. The first two are basically success and failures, which basically fetch the number of uh, boolean values one and zero. Then we have the count, which uh, lets you fetch the total quantity value, which is kind of hit ratio, where you get the fraction of the successes from the total count. And then the variation, which is basically based on the binomial redistribution based variance, which is basically the total count into uh, successes into um, failures. And then one of the most critical aspects of the new facts and accumulator is the confidence interval. Now, an interval is basically an interval estimate of a success probability P, which simply means that um, like for the given Boolean value, what is the confidence interval for the given probability P and that, that P is for the successes. And now the interval, the default interval, actually, I think I made a mistake here. The, Default one is Wilson interval, not walled interval first. Um, so we added a confidence interval, just like value or variance, where when you fetch the value, you get Wilson interval for the confidence interval. And in case you want to uh, choose any other intervals, you can uh, construct that using the classes that you already created and fetch the custom confidence intervals. And finally, uh, a lot of tests were added for the new accumulator as well as the intervals and all the utilities that we created for making the confidence intervals work. 
then there was a bunch of documentation built on oxygen that was added and um, after going through a, like a lot of changes and a lot of help from Hans as well um, the fraction estimator is added to boost our histogram and the peer has been merged now the next steps are to merge the histogram comparison on the python cyclosis uh, sorry on the python end and uh, that is basically a decision that we need to make if everything's working well. The other thing is to add the fraction accumulated to the Python end. So it has been added to C++. Now we need to bind that inside Python. And uh, in a general sense, keep working on Python and C++ and in an open source capacity after the fellowship. So yeah, that was pretty much it. Thank you for listening. Um, and uh, let me know if you have any questions. Uh, thank you, Jay. Um, Alex. Hi, yeah, thanks for the talk. Uh, I have a question about the histogram comparison in particular. That sounds quite interesting. So on mm -hmm. the site, you mentioned that you have the sort of private and, and public version. In the public yes. version, then, um, do you get any kind of uh, output uh, to yes. tell you what exactly disagrees? Because I can imagine with a high dimensional histogram, it can be difficult to sort of locate, uh, I mean, for the user, it's sort of like one yes, specific thing correct. disagrees. Yeah. Okay, so that's already so, printed out. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's going to be printed out. We'll specify, so for example, if there's an issue with the edges, then we specify the fact that the uh, comparison has failed because of edges, and we also specify the values of the edges because of which it has failed. Great, that sounds super useful, thanks. All right. Uh, Hans. Okay. Yeah, Han, do you have your hand raised? Yeah, I mean, now now after the talk, I also some things came to mind that I could say uh, regarding this work. So, I mean, uh, I think uh, Jay did really nicely in um, working himself to some complicated statistics math as well, because I mean, yeah, I mean, writing this accumulator is is not so complicated, but then uh, understanding how these interval calculators work and uh, some of the more non-trivial formulas um, require using the beta distribution and so on. And uh, yeah, so there were quite a, there was a quite a mathematical challenge as well. So which Jay uh, walked himself through and, and worked out. So that's really nice. Yeah. Well, that was because of your help. So thank you for that. Yeah, but you you researched it, so. All right. All right. Any other questions or comments? Uh, so, hello, uh, everyone. My name is Vyacheslav Kuchenko. I'm from Kiev Academic University, uh, second year of master's degree. My mentor is Dan Don Q from New Jersey Institute of Technology. And today I'm going to tell you about the result of Iris uh, Hello uh, Iris Hep Fellowship Project, which is ML tracking. So agenda would be next. Uh, I would like to start with the project description, give some background about graph neural networks, uh, describe some steps about data analysis and data preprocessing, um, train overview, uh, talk about a little bit about results and some acknowledgement part. So let's start with the project description. Uh, basically, the whole thing is around particles collision data simulated by Sphenix project. Uh, the goal is uh, to uh, analyze the um, behavior of particles after the detection, uh, sorry, after their beams, coll beams collision being detected. So um, detection is next. Um, it is happening by MVTX and INTD detectors. Uh, the first three layers, which can be seen on this picture, are MVTX. And uh, next four are uh, INTD detectors, which can also capture and measure the uh, momentum and the energy of particles, which can also come uh, as very useful data in the future. Um, so um, the main points about the data is that it has a very complex detector geometry, um, very high dimensional data, 9k by 9k and by 3. 
uh, variational data input since amount of particles can be changed. Uh, so the best solution uh, which comes from the data description is that we should apply models with flexible data dimensionality and uh, reduction of useless uh, data. Um, whole data can be represented as tracks, um, but tracks can be counted as graphs as you can be uh, as you can see here. So we have a bunch of nodes and a bunch of edges between uh, these nodes. Uh, what we can do is we can construct uh, tracks from uh, these points and apply some geometrical constraints in order to filter uh, the possible ones. Geomet geometrical thresholds are pretty uh, coming from the experiments. Um, and the goal is that with each iteration, we find more relevant tracks and optimize the process of matching the hits into graphs. Um, the, whole, the whole pipeline looks next. So we have uh, on detectors, we have a bunch of pixels which represent the particle being detected. We have to cluster these um, pixels into certain like one, um, one particle. After, after clustering, we have a set of hits with their information about each one. We then make a track uh, construction. And in order to filter uh, un unnecessary ones, use useless, we apply geometrical constraints. So uh, let's talk about uh, graph neural networks a little bit. Uh, the main GNN idea is uh, to uh, have information about nodes and edges and um, pre-process this data uh, as uh, as you wish, so we can predict, uh, we can make predictions on the node level, edge level, on or the graph level. In our case, since we reconstruct the tracks, so connections between the nodes, we apply edge level, but also in this project, uh, another team was working on trigger detection, which is basically graph level detection. So we can see here what uh, the idea of message passing lawyer main is. So having the nodes and it neighbor nodes, message passing, passing lawyer with time uh, provides information about also information of the um, neighbor nodes. Um, and also Python library for working with GNN is PyTorch geometrical. Uh, so let's talk about a little bit uh, here as an example, you can see graph level detection. So we have a bunch of nodes info and edges info as uh, input data for this uh, model. Then we apply this message passing lawyer, uh, which is also named as uh, graph convolution. We apply it uh, several times also passing information from the previous steps, which is called like um, uh, residual uh, concatenation. Um, also, we apply uh, some activation functions, which in our case were always uh, hyperbolic tangents. And then we apply uh, in the end some fit forward layer in order to apply, uh, in order to make binary classification. Uh, but in our case, everything uh, is a bit more um, uh, simpler. So we take nodes info and possible edges. And in nodes info, we have currently only geometrical data, uh, but uh, this will be expanded in the future. Uh, we apply n times a uh, combination of message lawyer passing uh, networks, also edge network and node network. In the end, we have node network, which predicts the probability of certain edges uh, being uh, connected between the nodes. Uh, let's talk about uh, data analysis and preprocessing. Uh, so um, raw data simulated by, by this Phoenix project uh, is represented as uh, G generated JSON samples containing information about events. And uh, it has a lot of information which has to be analyzed. Um, so each data, uh, each event consists of metadata of detectors, uh, data detectors data positions, their positions, IDs, also point IDs, pixel data, position chip info, particles, energy, momentum info, and also ground truth about vectors. So the processing part is next. Uh, main steps should be, uh, the first one is to unpack JSON raw data, carefully read points data by IDs. What I mean here by carefully is that uh, IDs with the negative number are counted as noisy ones. 
uh, here. So we should concatenate points from INTT and VTX detectors, uh, reconstruct tracks from ground truth, cluster points on one detector, as it can be seen here. So we have to choose one main detector, uh, one main point of particle and choose its coordinates. Currently, uh, we are doing it by collecting all nearby points and calculating the mean and equilibrium, so the center of this uh, detection, uh, and save the center coordinates uh, and also number of pixels being uh, on this one detection. We calculate um, cylindrical coordinates, which are uh, much um, relevant for our experiment since we have a tube uh, with a Z uh, aligned axis and uh, it is much better to calculate um, radius vector and also phi slope. Uh, segment uh, possible edges by geometrical constraints, uh, scale features and save them in appropriate format. Uh, so pre-process data should be um, next before the training. So we have scale geometrical data, our vector value, phi angle value, z coordinate across cylindrical x, um, amount of um, axis, sorry, uh, amount of pixels on chip used in clustering, and also possible edges combination between point edges. Let's talk now about training process. Um, so the technologies which were used for training are next. Uh, remote developing, SSH, Linux, and Conda 3. Um, my mentor provided me with an access on the server, which uh, has some um, powerful um, calculation sources. Uh, Python software engineering, OOP, and for constructing training class data loaders and models. Also Torch and PyTorch geometrical, uh, NumPy, and distributed book programming. And as a YouTube programmers, we used a 1DB for experiment tracking. Um, a little bit about uh, optimizer and the model which we used. So the optimizer was a classical Adam with uh, 1.001 um, uh, learning rate, weight decay is the same, and uh, with uh, learning rate decay schedule starting from the 16th epoch with uh, 0 0.1 factor. Also, we used uh, regularization methods, L1 and L2. Um, model was graph neural network consisting of MLP, H plus node networks. Uh, the whole amount of parameters were for the first experiments, uh, approximately seven and a half hundred, hundreds. Uh, and for the second one, two and a half thousand um, parameters. The loss was binary cross entropy. Uh, accuracy was a precision, uh, meaning correctly predict edges by all edges, and uh, data was next. So we had, uh, for the first experiment, 800 training events plus 200 validation, and for the second one, 2,000 uh, training and 400 validation. Training results are next. We can see that uh, for the lower data and lower model, we can achieve a primary accuracy uh, on validation set of about 0.76 or so uh, for um, larger data and larger model. We can achieve uh, within the same amount of epochs. We can um, uh, we can achieve 0.85 or so. Um, here are some examples uh, of the inference track reconstruction. Below, you can see that um, white lines is what our model predicted, and red lines are what uh, our model missed. So basically, the accuracy is quite good, but uh, should be increased uh, much more. Um, for other ideas for improving, um, any scaling of the raw parameters, I think that it should be applied in the initial layers of the network, since uh, scaling parameters can harm feature importance and should be fine-tuned by the model to maximize the performance. Also, we can um, we can count in the future energy and momentum, uh, which can be significant improve of results because of the extra input information. Uh, also, hyperparameters tuning, making lots of experience with um, graph neural networks, hyperparameters, uh, increasing the model and uh, data set expanding. Conclusions are next. 
Uh, I learned for this uh, whole fellowship graph neural networks models from zero and implemented some of the variations in the new PyTorch geometrical library. I met new people who taught me a lot of uh, encoding, data analysis, physics, context overview, and nuclear physics itself. I expanded my thoughts about international scientific cooperation by directly participating in it. Uh, and also, it is an honor to be a part of such interesting and cutting-edge project, which combines uh, classical scientific subjects, such as physics, together with machine learning engineering. And also, a little bit of acknowledgement. Uh, I would like to acknowledge the help of Denton Q in providing working resources and inviting me for this project. And also, I would like to uh, say thanks for Tintin Juan for helping with pipeline and sharing ideas of the implementation. Uh, thank you for attention. No, thank you for the talk. Um, any questions for uh, Vyacheslav? Oh, my mistake too. I saw. I see your uh, your mentor is connected. Uh, at least he was. Uh, yeah. Yep. Uh, Dan, tell yeah, you want to say anything about? About it just solves work. Sorry, it's my mistake. I didn't see you before. So, <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I'm here. Yeah. So, uh, we are Cheslav actually did outstanding work. So, that, uh, yeah, despite lots of difficulties, actually, like, because actually we have like a, lots of stringent firewall security requirements and he passed all the hoops. So, actually, I like, did uh, get fully understand about this very exciting project. So, that's a Little bit of background as Phoenix is actually the upcoming largest nuclear physics experiment uh, in the uh, United States. So that's going to take in data in February. And then that's uh, have a heavy ion collision, like a gold gold particle collisions. And uh, followed by like the next year, the proton proton, so that the data rate will increase 10, at least the uh, like collision rate is so. Uh, um, 20 times faster because actually I start from 50 kilohertz to 50 kilohertz to 9 million hertz on a proton proton. So that the uh, intelligent, the uh, intelligent, the, the, the online trigger detection is uh, the key to actually help us to filter out the data. Yeah. Great. Any questions? Uh, that sounds impressive. So, 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 any questions before we move on to our next talk? So, thanks again for the talk. Yeah, just one clarification. I just for these five layers, uh, the silicon detectors. So it only tracks uh, the geometry locations. So for like a little bit more advanced physics property, like for momentum, energy, that one can be actually inferred after we have this track information because we know the magnetic field and we know some geometry locations, um, put that into the whole event. And now we can sort of estimate the, the momentum that move one step or close, step closer to the real physics. That means the particle ID. Yeah. All right, thank you, thank you. Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, my name is Atali Hor Krasnobolsky. I'm from uh, Taras Shevchenko National University of Kyiv. Um, and uh, over the course of this summer and uh, a bit of September, I was uh, working on jet reconstruction with Julia, uh, together with Benedict Hegner and uh, Graham uh, Stewart, who were my mentors. And I have been doing that on behalf of uh, Iris Hub Fellowship Program. Um, so. Jet reconstruction is a task which is uh, it's basically uh, it, it's it can basically be described as clustering of uh, uh, measurements that come from telemeters. Uh, so, uh, depending on the alg uh, on the algorithm that we choose, we can have uh, very different results. Um, and it's a task that we want to perform efficiently because it's. Uh, Typically, we have a large data sets that come from telemeters. Uh, the algorithms involve, like all of the algorithms typically involve computing distances between um, all the particles that we have, all the measurement points. Uh, 
And uh, you can see on the right some examples of uh, two different algorithms and what they output on the same data. And we are mostly interested in the anti-KT algorithm, uh, which is on the bottom because it's uh, a bit more stable. Um, why do we need Julia for that? And what's Julia in the first place? Well, Julia is a programming language. Um, it's quite fast. It has been designed for uh, mathematics and all sorts of scientific programming, physics. Um, uh, it has a very interesting paradigm. Um, it basically uh, it's it's a very it, it has very easy syntax, very simple syntax, um, but it also beats Python on like any task, even when Python is on Numba and NumPy. Um, so it sounds like a nice thing to use. Uh, and the question is, maybe we can switch from Python and C++ to just Julia, um, on, at least on some task. And maybe there is some use case in high energy physics. So uh, the, the reason why Julia is fast is, well, besides it's uh, interesting, um, or rather con it's connected with its interesting uh, paradigm features and other features that it has is that it has been designed fast. So it's uh, fast by design and not with packages that you use as in Python. Uh, let's see an example of Julia code if there are people who uh, uh, didn't see it before. Um, so here I'm not, I'm basically showing you Julia on the left and Python on the right. And I'm not saying that Julia is any better than Python in terms of syntax, because it's obviously, it's quite similar, and nothing to compare here. Uh, but what I want to emphasize is that in Python, we, this code basically generates Mandelbrot set. It's absolutely unrelated to the project. It's just a demonstration of Julia. Um, in Python, we need to import uh, NumPy to, to uh, do that. And then we need to wrap our function into specific vectorization. And only then we can uh, actually generate uh, the, the, the resulting data. Uh, while in Julia, the vectorization is inbuilt, uh, it has inbuilt support for arrays, uh, which work quite fast. And everything that you can see here, even though there are no type annotations, everything is um, strictly typed and it works way faster. So uh, let's code up the NTKT algorithm in Julia. Uh, you can see it on the right. It's the full implementation. Uh, it takes about 42 lines of code. Uh, it's not very smart. Um, it's basically just straightforward. Uh, we just write the implementation of, of the algorithm in Julia from the paper. It's very straightforward. And let's see how, how well does it do in terms of speed? Like, is it is it really fast? Maybe Julia does everything for us and we don't have anything to optimize here. Maybe it's like very efficient and it's not. Uh, so uh, if we compare it to uh, C++ FastJet, uh, which is a standard uh, package that's written in C++ and it does basically this task, it's, it's designed for that. Um, it's the C++ FastJet is heavily optimized, so we are kind of we kind of consider it a, a standard, and we always compare um, algorithm with that. So Julia is way off, and at least this implementation is way off. Uh, we can see that it takes about eight seconds to run uh, on like some not not very big data set about like um, eight hundred points. While uh, the C++ FastJet is just, it's, it's below one second, it's nearly zero. So uh, we can do some profiling and just explore where, where are we stuck? Why, why is it so slow? And uh, here is a flame graph to, uh, truly is very easy to profile to generate this like uh, graph. Uh, it basically, you need two lines of code. Uh, so, the, the length of each bar represents uh, how much of the entire program runtime does this function call take. And then uh, as we go uh, deeper, uh, like uh, lower, it's, it's just basically the, the, the function call, uh, the, the function call stack. So um, we spend most of, our, most of our time in Jet Reconstruct, which is our main routine, so that's reasonable. And we spend most of the time computing distances, which is also kind of reasonable. But then in this distance function, we spend most of our time, and it's actually most of our runtime whatsoever, it's um, we spent it computing LLVM power F64 function, which is just floating point power function. Um, it shouldn't be that way. Uh, it's, it's, it, 
it should be it, i mean it, it does sounds weird but because uh, uh so we want to avoid computing this function it shouldn't be that that, that that it shouldn't be called that much and so what we can do is instead of this distance function which is like two lines of code we can code up another distance function which is um a lot less nice um but uh, this function avoids computing LLVM power f64 function because uh, even though in our algorithm we basically have powers that are integers but negative integers and Julia by default chooses um, floating point uh, number powers for that and we we can basically avoid doing that with with this uh, and also we we should cache all the distances because most of the distances remain remain unchanged. Um, I mean, on one iteration, we only change probably like one or two distances. So we also then clean up some code and uh, we measure it once again, and it's way better. Um, so we are down there on the bottom right, you can see the red arrow, which points where we are. Uh, let's remove the topmost graph so that we can see where we are actually. So again, we still have kind of we still scale poorly. This implementation scales poorly compared in comparison to C++ fashion, but it's less than a tenth of a second. It's already good. Um, so maybe we can find another way of uh, of, uh, um, uh, of, of, of implementing that. And to do that, we should look inside the FastJet code because FastJet has been heavily optimized and it has uh, another algorithmic complexity even. So we haven't done that initially because we thought that maybe there are some native Julian ways to code the algorithm efficiently and we, we should basically only use them and not use what has been done in FastJet because even though FastJet is very is a very sophisticated piece of code um, it's I mean it's uh, it, it's geniosity is, is kind of limiting so we can we are kind of limited by by the ways that um, it's optimized. For instance, we can't run FastJet on GPU, um, but it has very nice algorithmic complexity features. So let's just re-implement uh, what FastJet does in Julia, and maybe it will be better than what we have. Um, it is. Uh, so here we have uh, the same idea as FastJet does. Uh, it's They're lower. It's even better. Um, same code as FastJet, but coded in Julia. It's so obviously nothing can compare with uh, another algorithmic complexity. However, you optimize the, your code, it's still, this one has another algorithmic complexity. Uh, again, let's remove the topmost bar, uh, the, the topmost plot so that we can uh, see the scaling. So uh, here the, the strip is like the, this, uh, we have a, a big uh, magenta span here because uh, sometimes uh, Julia runs, uh, a uh, garbage collector and uh, it kind of uh, you know the, the the highest point here is when we run garbage collector but most of the times uh, the median is uh, outlined there is uh, most of the times we're actually on, on the bottom part of it um, so this is still uh, this is still not very optimal because uh, if if we think um, about it a, a bit more in terms of how Julia works internally. Uh, if we uh, try to look at the uh, compiled uh, code of this function and then uh, try to understand how, how Julia com is compiled and how everything works, we can basically make it even better um, if, if we help Julia a bit. And so here uh, the, the magenta one is, which is the lower, is, is the better and the final version. So the final version of the algorithm uh, is uh, about twice faster than just implementing uh, FastJet and Julia, but it's still it's still not as fast as FastJet, obviously. Even though uh, this version is completely runnable, um, it's it's quite fast, and it shows that uh, it, it's it's a long path from the initial naive implementation until this point where it's nearly as fast as. Uh, uh, as past it. So it, again, if you, this gap might, might look uh, like too big, but uh, just remember that we have uh, rescaled our um, uh, y-axis a couple of times. Um, 
Okay, so uh, this took actually a lot of time to, to make it work and to make it work that efficient. Um, this is kind of a proof that we can't get any faster with Julia, which is a, a bad result again, but it's basically what we aim for is to, to explore whether we can do any better. Um, a proof basically goes that we can profile it once again, and this implementation is just there, there is nothing we can optimize in this implementation. So the the longest bars in this uh, uh, in, in this plot, which works exactly the same as the previous one, uh, in, in the profiling one, the longest bars here, which I outlined with with this red arrows, are just uh, for loops, and we can't optimize for loops. For loops are just you know that they're uh, they're implemented once in in the core of the language, and you can't really change them. So there is no way you can optimize for loops, and basically everything else is just also pretty pretty solid and static everything else is just computing distances and uh, we compute them only once for each particle so it's, it's also not very um, uh, there are no uh, anomalies here it's just uh, it's it's probably the limit of Julia uh, but there are actually good parts about that uh, it's everything has been done and implemented as in the form of like one package in Julia and uh, because of Julia's simplicity and uh, flexibility, uh, this package also allows us to plot everything, which we can't do with FastJet. You can plot the results, and on the right, you can see the, the plot ha that has been generated with uh, with that package. And there are uh, the, the plotting function is also very flexible, so it basically works with whatever plotting package you want to use. Um, you can also run those algorithms that are, or at least actually I have implemented only this anti-KT algorithm, but once again, Julie is very flexible and basically, even though I've implemented only one algorithm, you can run any other sequential recombination algorithm with that. Um, uh, again, it, it can run on any user-defined uh, data, uh, data types. So that includes GPU data types, for instance. Um, we haven't done any measurements on the GPU because the code uh, isn't really, uh, again, th since it's basically a translation of the FastJet co code right now, it kind of doesn't make much sense to run it on the GPU, even though it may help on like very large data sets, but it's basically, it, you can run it on GPU at least. Um, yeah, so basically it's very flexible and you can use it in whatever, um, uh, whatever way you, you can, but it's still uh, pretty raw. And um, uh, the, the results were kind of disappointing, but um, maybe maybe we just didn't find the way of, of uh, pushing through the limit that Julia showed here. Um, I, throughout this project, I've learned actually a lot. It has been a, a, a very nice thing. And I'm very thankful to, uh, uh, all the people who helped me and uh, all the people who participated in it with me, um, uh, especially to, to Iris Happen, to CERN, to my mentors. Um, I learned a lot of uh, high energy physics. It was basically my introduction to the field. Um, I learned how to work with uh, high energy physics data, what software there is, what are the tasks, and what algorithms do we use there. Um, and some practical skills that I acquired include like, uh, how to automate tests for Julia repositories or for GitHub repositories in general, or how to use Julia profiling tools. Um, in summary, I'd say that uh, Julia can be quite fast if you know what you're doing. So if you're, uh, again, the, if we recall that it's, uh, the, the difference between FastJet and Julia has been narrowed down to, um, I think, like, well, to, to, to a very narrow distance in, in time. Um, it can be quite fast, but you need to know what you're doing. And once again, you won't be as fast as C or C++. Um, even with that, uh, Julia can provide some, uh, some, some uh, useful things in, in its usability and convenience. Um, and obviously, if you want to use uh, just Python for some scripting or something, then you might consider Julia as well, because it's it's faster than Python, obviously. 
Uh, if you want to look at some other use cases for Julian high energy physics, which actually some of them are more successful than, uh, than uh, the, the jet reconstruction task, you can look at the GitHub uh, Julia, Julia HEP uh, organization. Uh, and there is also my repository on the top of that. That's uh, basically the entire package implemented in Julia. Uh, so once again, um, there is a kind of, uh, it, it's kind of a, a summary and not a conclusion because there might be a way of getting Julia, uh, uh, optimizing Julia once again. Uh, thank you all for the attention. Okay, hey, Atel, nice. thank you for the uh, thank you for the talk. Um, any any questions or comments? I see a lively discussion in the chat. So I don't know yeah. if people have thoughts or I, uh, I, yeah, I had uh, just yeah, I just had a quick question. Um, so when you re-implemented the fast jet algorithm in Julia, yes. So my my understanding is you basically took the algorithm that was in C plus plus and you rewrote it in Julia. Is that yes, exactly. It, right. Yes. Yes. So and this is a totally subjective question, but if you looked at the two, uh, how did the readability compare? Uh, I'd say it's a bit better in Julia because in uh, C plus plus they used like a lot of. Uh, uh, basically, the, the code has been structured in a way that uh, in, in FastJet they use different um, strategies for different number of data points, and it's, it's basically a larger package. Maybe that is the reason, because mm. it's, uh, every, everything it is has, just it, has, it implements more corner cases or something. Like yeah, that. yeah, yeah, yeah. It implements okay. a lot of like branch branches and and uh, many sub functions. Okay. Okay. But uh, in in general, uh, I mean. Uh, one of the things that that's uh, that, that we needed to replace when translating was that there are no pointers in Julia, so we needed to just use like indices of, of some arrays, for instance, instead of uh, what C plus plus does. But in general, it's probably more of, uh, uh, again, yeah, it, it's a very subjective question. Uh, yes, no, I, I I realized that when I answered it. All right, I just want to say. Uh, excellent work, and it's really nice to to see tests like this being done. Thank you. Okay, a few more questions. Uh, Hans, I think uh, you were first. Yeah, so I just quick comment. So I don't agree with the statement that Julia is generally faster than Python. I mean, if you just take pure Python, then that's true. But if you add number in the mix, uh, Python can be as fast as Julia. So that's my comment. Okay, well, I, I think it depends on the task, but yeah, I mean, it's probably valid on some tasks. So yeah, okay. Okay, uh, Graham? Hi, uh, yeah, I, I just um, wanted to say from the supervisor's point of view, just how nice it was to work with Atel. Um, he really did a great job on this and we learned an awful lot from it of what we um, had, had set him as the task and he worked really independently on it. So. Um, I, I think he's um, yeah, proven himself to be a really able contributor um, in the field and, and this, uh, this particular project was, was really nice and uh, like I say, we, we learned quite a lot from it, um, a very interesting result, so thank you very much Tell, for all of your work. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Graham. Uh, Jerry? Uh, hi, sorry for late to the party. I, I just wanted to um, mention like a related project. So Terry Motto, um, who's the head of the software for experiments at CERN, he recently did a similar project, uh, uh, which the scope is larger. He did translate um, a part of the, what would be GN for V, um, the geometry part of that uh, geom to Julia. and um, something we found is that if you write code like C++, so same logic, right? Like, like what we are doing here, you sometimes get beaten by C++ because the logic in C++ uh, was optimized for C++. Of course, the algorithm part, right? You'd hope it's about the same, but there are other things that can influence your results. So one thing uh, you mentioned is the for loop seems to be irreducible um, in terms of the time. 
that's not exactly true, right? Because you could you could do unrolling, you could do simmed, you could do you know uh, a few tricks. And in the other one, uh, the the uh, the geometry code, the bottleneck was C plus plus library was written in a way that chases these uh, uh, virtual pointers for different uh, types of geometries. So th they would single dispatch on you know a function like distance to the to the surface of the uh, geometry the sub module or whatever and then you have a lot of variations um in the types of the geometry and then in c plus plus it's just you know it's a single dispatch you just need to look at which uh type this object is and then the v table is just order and look up but in julia because of multi-dispatch that is way slower because uh it, it has to look at all the types of the function right so what i'm saying is uh yes probably like a line to line translation only gets you so far but it's still a pretty good sign to see that you know um if you can implement this in a very short amount of time with debugging and development overhead much smaller than you would have in c++ and you still get similarly speed and then probably we can optimize from here by deviating from the exact design of c++ but yeah um thank you for the comments yeah and also thank you for uh, some help with, with the projects where all right thank you everybody for uh, the discussion um uh before uh, andre gets started there's one of his mentors i think all of his mentors are actually connected so that's a uh, so does anyone any one of his mentors want to say a few words before uh andre speaks um yeah, sure. Uh, so I'll uh, uh, I'll start. <laughs> um, so this was a fun experiment that we ran together with Andre. We asked him to write a realistic analysis in roots or data frame, um, uh, you know, fairly complex uh, analysis example, and we were curious to see how difficult it would be to express uh, certain operations, in particular systematic variations. I was curious to see what pain points or limitations he would find, etc. Uh, so it was not a simple project, and uh, he delivered on all points. We learned many valuable insights in the process, and it was a pleasure working with him. So many, many thanks to Andre for for all his work, um, and uh, of course uh, to Oksana and Alex for co-supervising. In particular, Alex was in the invaluable source of the physics knowledge that we used for this project. So he really had a uh, a key role in the project. Okay, great. So, Andre, why don't you get, go ahead and get started? Okay, hello everyone. My name is Andre. I am a student from Taras Shevchenko National University of Kiev, and uh, I was uh, very happy to be supervised by uh, Enrico Giro, Alexander Felt, and Oksana Shadra. And uh, as Enrico said, my uh, project was the root data frame ktbar analysis implementation so uh let's go let's start with a bit of context uh here is what is ktbar analysis you know uh, that top quarks are produced in proton proton collisions at lhc and the first analysis task is to define the basic algorithm for selecting events uh, that uh, produce it uh, by the top quark pair production channel among uh, other events uh, produced from concurrent channels, some of which are presented in the left part of this slide. Uh, in particular, you can see TT bar pair production uh, diagram itself, and uh, also uh, three other channels, uh, uh, single top quark channels. Uh, and uh, uh, problem question is uh, how one can be sure he selected uh, the same events as he needs. Uh, to verify the efficiency of an algorithm, simulation da simula simulated data can be used. Uh, and uh, uh, it's because in simulation we can uh, be exactly sure, uh, we, we know that uh, we, we know which processes were involved in any particular event. Uh, 
and we we can be exactly sure we selected uh, events we 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 search for. So uh, the algorithm I speak about has been already implemented by my mentor Alex Held, and uh, uh, on the right side you can see an example. Uh, of some of uh, the producer uh, uh, example of producer histograms in his implementation. And uh, my uh, goals were first uh, to write Kitibar analysis specification in plain English uh, without uh, any references to implementation details. So it's only uh, uh, analysis logic description. Uh, secondly, uh, implement TTBR analysis pipeline uh, with root data frame uh, and produce the same histograms uh, as Alex. Uh, I, I have done it. And uh, last part of uh, my project was benchmarking uh, to be sure that all things uh, are going right and uh, um, my application can be used uh, in uh, uh, any other similar case in, in, in similar case, uh, uh, you understand. Uh, so the benefits from uh, done work is validation of roots modern analysis interface uh, because uh, produced histograms are exactly the same as uh, uh, obtain Alex uh, and the uh, root data frame uh, in my implementation shows good performance. Also, it is a good example of uh, realistic analysis pipeline uh, and uh, it can be reused in similar cases. Uh, uh, here is a few words about, uh, uh, about input data. It is uh, uh, CMS open data, uh, which is uh, presented by nine subsets of root file produced in Monte Carlo simulation. Uh, as five interaction channels uh, were involved, uh, we have uh, at least five subsets of root in input files. And additionally, for TTBAR channel, uh, uh, we are accumulated uh, four kinds of variations uh, already in simulation stage and totally uh, we had nine uh, subsets of root files. Uh, you can see in the uh, right side of this slide uh, nine rectangles with uh, some names each rectangle uh, 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 corresponds to different uh, data sets. And let's go into some details about TTBR analysis. Uh, the TTBR analysis algorithm relies on the semi-leptonic decay schema presented on this slide. We can identify events with top quark pair annihilation by observing decay products. As can be concluded from this diagram, one lepton, two jets, and two B-target jet uh, are expected to be detected in uh, uh, the semi-leptonic TTBAR decay channel. Uh, so the first part of the algorithm is selecting events containing all mentioned particles. Uh, the mass of the top quark can be restored by two B-target jet and one jet. Uh, no, no, it's uh, it's mistake. Uh, I mean, we we are looking for two uh, jets and uh, one B target jet. Uh, you can see in uh, semi-leptonic decay schema. Uh, and the second part uh, is defining the trijet combination, which is assumed to be decay product of the T quark per. Uh, uh, in, in this event. Uh, yeah, this image in the right side summarizes uh, all things. Uh, first, uh, uh, I uh, 
select events with at least with one lepton and four jets. Uh, uh, select only events uh, with two B target jets. It means that uh, uh, B tag of two jets is higher than some threshold. Uh, when we select all good events, we build all trijet combinations. Uh, select only thus uh, for which max uh, B target jet is higher than uh, some threshold and define the maximum transverse momentum. S uh, it's uh, scalar value, scalar sum. Uh, more details uh, you can find in my analysis specification. I leave a link. Uh, and uh, when I apply this uh, algorithm, uh, I have produced uh, histograms uh, that you see in left slide, uh, in, on the left side of this slide. Uh, note uh, that in right side, I have applied another selection requirement. Uh, and uh, e, uh, here I have got worse results because contributions from other uh, competing channels are too significant. Uh, it's uh, it's mean that in right uh, side, uh, our algorithm is not effici efficient uh, because uh, here are large contribution from uh, uh, concurrent channels, WebJet, single top TV, and the others. But in left side, uh, their requirement uh, I speak about in a previous slide uh, gives uh, a very, very good selection algorithm. So, uh, and also, uh, uh, I uh, take into account uh, uh, another kinds of variations. Uh, the variations uh, we speak about in a previous slide originated uh, already in simulation process. Uh, it's, uh, it's due to lack uh, of knowledge uh, uh, or knowledge in uh, physics processes, how to simulate it. but. Uh, this very, uh, these variations uh, are due to uh, detector response because uh, also we cannot be exactly, we, we don't exactly know detector response. And uh, uh, here is total of, of uh, 122 histograms because uh, the number of uh, all variations is large. Uh, in, the, in the left uh, si uh, par part of this slide uh, is uh, jet energy variations. Uh, here I evaluate uh, transverse momentum values. While in the right side of this slide, I evaluate uh, weights. Here is difference between these two variations. Uh, and uh, uh, you, you can go to details to my Jupyter notebook. And the last part of my project uh, was benchmarks. A few words about uh, matching specification. Uh, here there are uh, 64 physical cores and 128 logical cores with uh, 125 gigabyte of memory. Uh, I have the lot uh, uh, all input files to the fast SSD because uh, accessing to input files by network is uh, very slow. And what we, we measure here is time uh, that uh, takes is execution uh, RAM usage and throughput. Uh, also, uh, we uh, I tried uh, both coffee executors for comparisons future and thus, and different optimization levels or one or two or three. Uh, 
Uh, here you can see a version of uh, root and of coffee. Uh, and uh, let's uh, see at uh, the first plot. Uh, the only thing I uh, want to emphasize here is that O2 and O3 uh, gives the same speed up, but uh, uh, higher, enough higher result uh, than O1. So it's a great idea to change uh, default uh, O1 to O2, for example. Uh, and uh, uh, I want to show a few more plots. Uh, here is time and RAM usage dependence uh, on the number of used cores uh, for this number of events. Uh, you can uh, see um, that uh, Dusk is not much faster than Futures, but occupies more a memory. Uh, and you can see that uh, Coffee takes uh, more a memory and time than RDF in this case. Uh, and uh, also it is uh, notable uh, that uh, hyperthreading does not help uh, Coffee much as, uh, as well uh, as for RDF uh, is because uh, we have defined the number, number of uh, physical cores and uh, Gipper threading is, uh, is in principle not uh, bad, but works for coffee. I don't know why. Uh, and it uh, helps very little with RDF. And uh, here is plot with uh, throughput, uh, throughput independence from number of files. Uh, some uh, conclusions, both uh, RDF and coffee throughput is constant with uh, respect to the number of files as we expected. Uh, and uh, for my implementation and uh, benchmark setup, uh, root data frame often is in two times faster. Uh, but in general, root data frame is uh, between a uh, factor uh, 1.25 and 2 faster, depending on uh, amount of files processed and average file size. Uh, also, it is important that uh, uh, coffee is known to benefit from chunk sizes larger than the default. So uh, I can not uh, conclude from uh, my results uh, the, that uh, uh, because, because neither application is optimized for performance. So I cannot uh, to make uh, solid conclusions about performance uh, in coffee and uh, uh, it would be well to do uh, further investigations here. Uh, but as conclusion, root data frame uh, works very well and uh, it, uh, it gives uh, a little bit best performance than coffee as we expected. Uh, thank you for your attention. Any questions? Uh, thank you, Andre. Uh, any questions for Andre? No. Okay. Uh, thank you again. Uh, thanks everybody for, for attending. Thanks for some of the lively discussion we had today. So um, appreciate all your efforts with mentors and fellows. So uh, thanks again. Thank you, everybody. Some really great work.